Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Reema Arana. I'm director of um, Toro University's Faculty Development Center, the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. Uh, we are so happy to bring this wonderful webinar opportunity to you. It is in collaboration with the Toro University Midtown Library. We have uh, Kirk Schneider joining us with a team of faculty, not just from our campus, but also from the West Coast. So um, we're excited for this webinar. As you know, with life-changing um, events that have taken place, the library and the book industry is also transforming and changing on a daily basis. We This webinar is about the open educational resource, how you can directly help save um, our students thousands of dollars. Kirk will give you the exact figures, but Toro University has been saving our students thousands of dollars every year in terms of textbooks. Now, with that said, you might be wondering how can, not just how can I save my students money as well, but also how can I go about making this contribution to academia through OER, through better textbooks? What does it take to put one together? How does Toro University and Kettle support you in doing so? Um, all our three faculty today are recipients of the OER, um, grant to put together a textbook from the office of the provost we'll shortly have a new call and i encourage all faculty to apply for this uh, to see in what aspect of your curriculum an oer textbook will serve um, students and not just students from our campus you're contributing to the larger conversation that's happening in your discipline and of course, you are contributing to academia by through your through your academic work in OER. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, this uh, webinar will be recorded, so the link will be available shortly. If you have any questions for our panel, please save them save it until the end. Uh, put your questions in the Q and A chat. If it's something generic to be answered, we will do it. Otherwise, please, uh, we will get to your question at the end. Thank you to my colleague, Jim uh, Ligorski, for helping us with the IT tech aspect of this. And a friendly reminder before I take give this to Turk, uh, Kirk, I'm sorry, is um, on May 11th is Toro, the Toro University Systems Interprofessional Educational Summit, the IPE Summit. If you haven't um, registered yet, please do so. Um, and it is going to be a wonderful experience. We have a great keynote speaker. So um, turning this on to you, Kirk. All right. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rima. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Oops. There we go. Um, can you can you see that all right? See my slides? Yes. All right, great. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rima, so much um, for the introduction and um, also for the, the support of this project, what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, so, so uh, yeah, as, as Rima said, um, I, will, I will start out uh, talking about the fellowship today, and then we're going to hear from three, uh, three of our faculty fellows who part have participated in the fellowship this past year. Um, we'll hear from Michelle Zacharin from the Turo Law Center and Virginia Koenig from the S School of Health Sciences in Manhattan, in uh, the who's working in the new Doctorate of OT program, and um, Michelle Bunker Alberts who is. Uh, beaming in from the West Coast, from Turo, California, uh, who's in the graduate nursing program. Um, so those three 
uh, are going to talk about their experience in the fellowship. Um, but uh, first, first, I'm going to talk ab about Turo's Open Educational Resources Fellowship and, um, and also just our OER initiative <clears throat> here at Turo. Um, so first, to start that out, I'm going to talk about, about money. Um, so higher ed, higher ed is facing an affordability crisis. And in the past three decades, there has been an astronomical rise in textbook costs, that, which is more than three times the rate of inflation. Um, and students are in the pos this position of being what, what is called captive consumers, where instructors assign a textbook and students are required to, to buy that book to complete and pass the class. So in situations like these, the seller feels free to charge basically whatever they want uh, for the product because the consumer has no choice but to buy the product. So students are, are, are tra trapped in this kind of sticky situation here. Um, and this graph uh, with data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows um, the rate of inflation and uh, the consumer price index, which is a measure of that. So it shows the consumer price index of, of all items um, has, you know, the, the light blue line has risen 48%. And it and uh, college textbooks, the navy blue line, you see are more than more than three times that rate. And also interestingly, um, this goes to the what I was talking about with the captive consumers thing that how this affects college textbooks, but not uh, the 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 book publishing world in general. You see at the bottom what they're calling recreational books or other other types of books and literature that are non textbooks have actually um, decreased in in price over the years, while textbooks have continued to skyrocket. Um, so we know that that this that these factors are affecting our students at Turo. Um, this this data here is from the, the library's customer satisfaction survey, um, just from a few months ago in December, and um, and it it showed us that you know many many of our students are not purchasing the required textbooks because of because of their cost, and it also shows the other measures that students have had to take or things that have happened to them as a result of the prohibitively expensive textbooks. You know, some have had to take fewer classes, as you can see, or some have earned a poor grade because they didn't have the book. Uh, some have cho chosen not to register for a specific course because of what that course requires. Um, some have had to withdraw or drop, or some have even failed courses um, because they didn't have the book. Um, so, so we know uh, this isn't just an abstract thing, but it's it is affecting our students here at Turo. So one fantastic solution uh, to this problem is open educational resources. Um, so first, first of all, they're they're free, totally free to use. Uh, there's no cost to the student or professor either. And um, they have other benefits as well. Since they're digital and reside online, uh, students have access to the books from day one of class and their access won't get cut off ever. And in fact, they're accessible to anyone who just has, an, has internet access. Um, and their students find them convenient as, as, we're, as they're learning more and more uh, the learning environment shifts more and more to uh, online. Um, a lot of students find that they like having their learning materials also be in that same online space and using digital textbooks. Um, and um, and 
And uh, this is the online aspect also adds a lot of convenience and it may sound silly, but a lot of students actually complain about, you know, having to carry heavy backpacks and stuff with when they're using big traditional textbooks and having to lug these things around. These are things that students do consider as well. So, so with OE, OER are very convenient in that in that way. Students can just have anything on their phone or on their laptop or or whatever device they have with them. And on top of that, um, OER have even been shown to produce equal or even slightly better academic outcomes in students um, over traditional textbooks, which I'll uh, which I'll touch more on. Um, so just to to make sure we're all on the same page, um, here's a definition, um, a really widely used definition of OER here. So. They are teaching, learning, and research resources that either reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. So we often talk about textbooks as a kind of main example of OER, and but OER aren't only textbooks. They can also be any, any other type of resource that you can teach with. You know, it can be individual modules. Can be uh, videos, syllabi, uh, interactive uh, question banks or testing software. Um, can be practically anything that is that is used for teaching and learning and that is openly licensed. Um, so, uh, what makes something OER? It uh, the thing that defines that and differentiates an OER from a traditional or commercial uh, textbook or resource is the intellectual property license. So, um, it, in OER use uh, Creative Commons licenses, or they're often just abbreviated to CC licenses. Um, so this is what makes something OER. If you see a resource that has a CC license on it, that is an OER. And, um, and contrary to popular belief, uh, CC licenses are not the antithesis to copyright. They are actually technically and legally are copyright licenses themselves. They're just a different kind, a specific kind of copyright license that gives the author or creator of, of a resource uh, more control over it. Um, more control over how exactly that, that work is used and shared. Um, so <clears throat> with the traditional copyright license, you know, the it's all all rights reserved is um is how that's described so that's the automatic you know rights statement that's uh, that's automatically applied to any any written creative work any book any anything um so cc licenses like i said are they're they're a type of cre of uh copyright license that you could uh you could say means some rights reserved. So it's like a cop they're like copyright licenses that um, just give you give you more more options. They allow the author to they allow the author to let their work be shared freely and openly. That's um, um, that's uh, which which can't be done with a traditional copyright all rights reserved work. Um, so um, how can you be a part of, of this solution for students? Um, this, our OER faculty fellowship is um, the, the, uh, the perfect way to get started using OER and to learn about it and to get help and support in this process of, of doing it. and and switching you know one of your courses to being cost free for students um so um uh like we mentioned at the beginning the fellowship is, it's a collaboration between Turo libraries and uh the office of the provost and um the center for excellence in teaching and learning 
So we have um, there the Office of the Provost's generous support in uh, supporting the stipends that we pay to our fellows. So fellows get a $500 stipend for this work that they're doing. Um, and the fellowship is intended to just support faculty to develop an OER for one of their courses. So to replace a previously used commercial textbook and make their class be uh, cost-free for the students. So uh, what, the, what this fellowship entails is uh, it is a six month period um, where we'll have uh, monthly group meetings uh, facilitated by the library, by myself, the OER librarian. Um, so we'll, myself and, and all the fellows together will meet monthly. And, um, and there's an education aspect where, um, where, where we provide kind of training and education at each of these meetings on different aspects of OER. So some of those things we cover are finding and evaluating OER, uh, and then copyright and intellectual property licensing, like the CC licensing that I was talking about, um, accessibility, best practices, and all the different tech platforms uh, that are available and that are out there for using with OER. Um, so we meet monthly and, and cover cover each of those things. And we also have like individual support is offered as needed between between meetings for for fellows, you know, for their own work on their projects. And um, there's also an online assessment aspect um, where the the fellows can, go through this online OER course to kind of test their their knowledge of you know what we're covering and re reinforce um, everything they're learning about OER. And and then uh, what the fellows act actually make, because that's that's a big huge part of it, of course, the fellows will be will be busy um, either adopting, adapting or creating OER. So um, You'll hear those those kind of three options for working with OER. You hear those terms a lot when you're reading about OER, and um, those are the options a person has. So uh, I'll say briefly what that means. To so you can adopt adopting an OER resource uh, means to select um, and evaluate an existing OER resource um, that aligns with your curriculum to to use for your class and you're using it basically as is but so that's adopting a resource that's one option that the fellows have or or anyone using oer has um and then adapting that means uh when you when you uh when you use an open resource but you make some changes to it yourself because of course that's one of the great things about oer that this open licensing allows you can uh, make changes. You can make edits to a work. Uh, you can combine pieces from one OER with pieces from another one and put them together into your own tailored resource. And and uh, in fact, that's what that's what some of our fellows are doing. Um, and you know, we've at Turo, we've had people do do all three of these options. We've had many professors adopt uh, resources as is. We've had many folks adapt. Uh, to to make their own kind of remixed resource, and we've also had people create original OER, um, including some of our fellows here, which you'll hear about. Which which just means you know original authorship of a resource, you know writing writing your own resource, your own textbook. Um, that is an option for OER as well. So um, so uh, a fellow can can work with OER on, on any of those levels in the fellowship. Um, so that, those are kind of some, some basics of, of what it entails. And, um, oh, uh, also with the, I should say with the expectation that then so the, the fellows uh, develop a open resource and then with the expectation that they will within a, within a year, within a calendar year of the fellowship that they'll um, put that resource uh, into practice and start in their classroom and start teaching with it in their class. 
Um, so uh, now I want to talk to you a little about the impact of the fellowship and how uh, what it's done for for Turo and where we're at with OER. So um, so this this uh, graph here shows the cost savings that OER use at Turo has provided students. So since we started the initiative in 2018. Um, you know, we we started we started small and had some gradual growth here, and um, and then kind of starting in fall of 2020 here, you see it really picked up quite a lot, and that is um, that is a, a direct result of beginning the fellowship. That's when uh, that's when we started our first round of the faculty fellowship, and. Uh, those those fellows um, those fellows uh, starting to work with OER um, you know gave us a huge boost. Some of those fellows taught in very high enrollment classes, so they're reaching hundreds of students uh, a semester, and so it um, it's you know really really had a big really had a big effect um, on our student savings and on our. Uh, OER initiative. So you'll see, um, you know, it took us about two years, four semesters to get up to the $100,000 savings mark. But then since that point, since we started offering the fellowships, it's increased $100,000 every semester, roughly. So that has put us now at the awesome milestone of being over half a million dollars saved for our students at Turo. Um, yeah, which we which we just reached this milestone uh, just uh, at the end of last semester, the fall fall semester. So now we're we're going up uh, going up toward the six hundred thousand dollar mark here here this semester as we as we keep getting the savings uh, numbers in from professors. So um, so yeah, in just uh, just just five you know for just five years. Um uh we got uh we got to this great great milestone. Um and we are a very, I should say, you know, was we're a very small, small initiative. It's I it's just basically myself and we have a small team of Sarah Tabai and uh the information literacy director of Turo Libraries. Um and the scholarly communications librarian, which is David Drulinger. So um, we're just a, a small, very small department here, but the fellowship has helped us um, in in uh, big ways. Um, so to uh, switch gears a little bit, as, and aside from the financial aspects, um, let's look at academic success. So, you know, it, the financial savings wouldn't wouldn't mean very much if if OER if teaching with OER didn't work well if you know if students weren't doing well or you know if it if it wasn't good but um, but what people are actually finding is that you know consistently across the board classes taught with OER is, you know students have have similar like equal to slightly better academic outcomes. And um, and and it also, aside from just their earning better grades, it helps students in these other ways in that it's student-centered, it's focused on them and their needs. Um, it it meets them where they're at in their, you know, you know, living a lot of their lives online. And uh, it's equitable. It gives it gives more students access to education. Um, and one of our this quote here is from one of our Turo professors um, who saw a five to ten percent uh, bump in his students' grades after using an open textbook. And they they also um, they also noted that they were having better student evaluations as well. So students' perception of the course and their their experience in the course was was better as well. Um, and uh, OER is you know it, it is a student centered thing, but it also does have a lot of benefits for faculty. So 
um, I don't want that to get lost in the mix here. Um, so publishing as a as a faculty member, publishing your own work as an OER uh, at at Turo University, it counts toward promotion and tenure as a, as a scholarly publication, and it's also great for increasing the visibility and readership of your work, since since it's um, it's it's open and free online. You'll get a lot of readers, uh, a big readership, and and that means then that it's just more more likely to be used and cited by others. So um, so it. Uh, there's there's a lot of great things about it for faculty as well. Um, and um, so so um, before before our our fellows talk about their experiences here, I just um, I hope I hope that folks in the audience will consider uh, working with OER for faculty. I hope you'll consider applying for the fellowship. Um, as Reba mentioned, we are just about to announce the open application for our next round of the fellowship, which will come out in the next faculty focus newsletter. So um, the link to apply will be there. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, we will be will be starting again in the summer, this next round. And so, uh, yeah, so please keep it in mind and please be on the lookout. And um, I'll leave leave you with a few quotes from this great recent article that looked at at all the studies um, that have been done on academic success, student academic success in using OER and um, the benefits. So if the average college student spends approximately $1,000 per year on textbooks and yet performs no better than the student who use, utilizes OER for free, what exactly is being purchased with that $1,000? And what is the point of that? And um, they analyzed 16, 16 research studies and um, concluded that researchers and educators may need to more carefully examine the rationale for requiring students to purchase commercial textbooks when high quality, free, and openly licensed tech textbooks are available. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, please consider applying to the fellowship. The link is here when folks get the slides, when folks get the slides after the webinar today. And also, uh, like I said, be on the lookout for the announcement in Faculty Focus. Um, so thank you very much. and. Um, if you have if you have questions for me, you can um, I'll, I'll take questions myself and all the other speakers will take questions at the end. We'll have a Q and A period. So um, so you can uh, you can write your question in the chat though, so you don't have to hang on to it in your mind. And then we'll address everything at the end. So any questions at all, please dump them in the chat. And um, and thank you very much. And we will move on to our first fellow uh, our first fellow presenter, uh, Michelle Zacharin from the Turo Law Center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kirk. Thank you for all of that. And thanks everyone for being here. I'm excited to share with you my experience with OER and my experience with my project that I was working on. So um, again, thanks for being here. I'm gonna go ahead and get this set up and... So um, this, you know, um, this is what I teach in the law school. I see teach it the at the in the law center. So um, this is what legal books look like, but you know they're not that much different from other books. And um, you know we we do as Kirk said, they, they're so expensive and they're so expensive for the students and. We understand, we talk about it at, at Toro Law School, we talk about it, that there are students who face financial insecurity and part of, you know, the ways we can save is possibly reducing um, the amount of textbooks they need to buy. I think we all share that mission. I know it's easier in some courses than in others and certainly challenging 
to think about getting started, but really in practice, it's not as challenging as the thought of it. it it's not. And so I hope today you'll walk away with realizing that it is not quite um, as challenging to start adopting OER. So for me, um, just so you know a little bit about, about me, this was a case book that um, I had used in the past, I openly admit, um, when I taught a class called Entrepreneurship Law. It's an elective course, which means they take it for fun. They're really um, taking it. They have very few elective courses that they're able to take in the law school. And so they choose them sparingly and wisely. And they, you know, those who chose the entrepreneurship class at, at one point when I taught it, the, the book was $298. And um, that just bothered me. It just bothered me. So the next time I was teaching it, I decided I can't, I just can't. I just decided I'm not I'm not charging them. I'm not going to make this part of my class. There's no book requirement. And so I said, it's a little bit more work for me in the beginning, but I had time. I knew I was going to be teaching it. I knew I had a few months, you know, over the summer or whenever that I was going to be able to prepare. And I, I, I knew that there were cases in the book and that they can get those cases for free. And I knew sometimes they had to be edited, but I knew I can edit them and I can change and put, put it in the way I wanted with the material I wanted there. I knew there were um, articles out there that they could get also for free. They have access to it. And so I did do a little bit of the legwork but the funny thing is, is that now next time I teach this class, it's all done. It's, I mean, I can add and remove as I see fit, but it's never the same as when the first time you're looking for the material, searching, editing, um, you know, it, it's, it's so much easier after that. And, and so let me just, you know, this I had already said, um, but it's, the type of thing where I didn't create anything new for that project. I, I wasn't a fellow. I didn't create anything new. I just on my own wanted to save them money. And, um, you know, I was able to use existing OER, uh, open, open educational resources that were out there. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. But um, I thought it was great. And I even asked the class at the end of the semester, you know, in the beginning, I let them know there's not going to be a, a case book and that we're going to have other materials to use. And at the end of the semester, one of the questions I asked the class randomly and anonymously was just, you know, please let me know your thoughts on the class having no textbook. And they, it was unanimous that they were, they thought they, they, the class was like the materials were great that, you know, were presented. They felt that they were great, that they adequately provided what they needed, but also the cost savings was such a benefit to them that they all openly stated how they really appreciated it. So like Kirk said, you can use OER materials in your class and that's just a great way to start. And that's what I did. Um, and, and you can use some, you can use all, right? You can start by just using a little bit of OER and seeing how that feels. And most of us use learning management systems now like Canvas. And so it's really easy to put links that are online onto Canvas and just it's available to the students instantly. Um, or, you know, the third way that you, what you can do is you can write your own materials. And so that, you know, I will talk about in a, in a moment. Um, but as you know, um, all of these are benefits, right? It provides access to everyone. It, it modernizes the teaching style, um, you know, and it allows the teachers to think about how did this benefit my students or how can I do things better? Or how can I find things that say things in my own way, in a way that I think it should be explained? Um, there's a lot and it's, there, it's nice for the students to be able to evaluate the benefits as well um, because you do hear complaints about the cost of textbooks. Um, and I think part of the problem is that a lot of faculty don't realize that there are alternatives. And I think part of this initiative at Toro is so what's so wonderful is that it's bringing awareness or of that to everyone. So also what's really nice is that it's great for diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is such a big part of, of what we, of, of all higher education, of all education, you know, so, so um, it just is more equitable so that everyone can have access to the book. And it's not like, oh, there's, you know, a few people who really maybe couldn't afford it and they're trying to get access and they don't have access. And, and it's just nice. It's, it's free for everyone and it's accessible to everyone, regardless of financial need or abilities or disabilities. And, and that's just another wonderful perk about it. This is an example. I just put it up here because why? I don't know. I just wanted to show you an example. This is an example of what I used. It's not the only thing I use. It's just one thing. I, I was talking about ethical um, issues in entrepreneurship that had to do with like the legal field. And 
all of a sudden through a few searches, I came across something like this, which was, um, which was somebody else's material, but it was on an open educational resource, which allowed me to access it for free, give it to my students. And we were able to use this. It, it, I, it, this is just a slide, but if you click through, there are more and more, uh, there's more material here than what it looks like on this screen, but it was a great addition to what, you know, as part of their reading for that week. Um, and it, it was just a great thing that I happened to find. And so the more that we put out there, the more accessible, the more material there is for everyone. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I wanted to make sure you knew, and I think Kurt covered this already, but there really is a lot of support for OER development through things like grants and a fellowship, like there is a Toro and, you know, summer writing stipends and things like that. So it's something to really consider um, that there is support through Toro University itself to really help you get started and continue on your journey as you start. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my project. So I, I received a grant and I received this, um, this Toro faculty fellowship at the same time. And it was just such a blessing. It was so wonderful because it was an exciting project that I was about to begin. And so I have been teaching legal writing a long time. This is my 20th year, actually. Um, and so I have some unique methods like we all do when we've been teaching for a while. You have some unique styles and unique ideas about how you present material and the books I use have their own way. And so I'm always modifying anyway, when I'm teaching, I'm they're reading the book, but I'm saying also hearing myself say things like, well, here's another way we can look at that. And here's the way I would format that paragraph or that series of paragraphs. And so um, I decided that it was really time. And I, I thought it would be very useful to create a book um, that demonstrates the way I teach it, but also make it available. Why not make it available to everyone? And so that's what I've been working on is a book on legal writing, the objective part of legal writing um, that all first year students take their first semester. And um, it's been great. I, I really spent a lot of time developing this. And so the plan has always been to implement it in the fall of 2023. Um, and it's, it's a digital book. And so what I, I'd like to show you, or I, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I'd like to show you an example of what it looks like. I'll share my screen in a moment just to flip through a few of the pages. So you can actually see that it feels, it looks, it's very much like any other case book, uh, textbook that you'd use. It just happens to be in a digital form, um, but it will ha it has examples and like my kinds of teaching problems, right? It has a video component because I don't mind creating videos, talking and, and explaining things verbally and then putting that video there in addition to, to for what's written in the book. Um, and it's completely digital, well, digital, it'll be accessible to everyone. So students that are in my class, that would be their required book, right? It's free and that would be it. But in other classes, um, I would love it if others would adopt it. And if they didn't adopt it in full, I'd love it if they adopted it in part, if, if there's any part of it that could be useful to them because it's free and available, it would just be such a wonderful, wonderful thing. So um, there'll be a section on rubrics and a section on, you know, different different things that come into play wait for the teacher and for the students to understand about the grading, basic writing skills, grammar and punctuation. And that's just in addition to like the actual legal writing. Um, and I just threw this in there because as we're all now more familiar with Canvas, having the book um, available, it can be linked onto Canvas where they always just have it. It can be anywhere because it's digital. They can always have it, but it's something that they can always pull up in a moment's notice. They don't have to remember to bring the book to class. They don't have to remember to carry it. Um, it can't get lost. You know, all of those traditional things about digital versus non-digital material. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to reiterate how, you know, wonderful I, I think this is. I really believe in it. I've seen it work um, firsthand and working with Kirk and everyone on this team, all the other fellows, I really see how practical and, and useful it is and really part of the future. I wanted, of course, I thank you, Kirk. And I also thank Irene McDermott at the, at the law school um, for being such, you know, help, so, such great help um, with this project for me. Um, able, they're able to answer questions at a moment's notice, which is wonderful. And so I just want to say that, you know, thank you. And just with one, if I could just take one more minute, I'd love to just share 
quickly. Um, the the book I've been working on. So let me just see where where that is. Um, it should be right here. Give me one second. Sorry. Um, here we go. Okay, so if you can see this, I, and it's it's not the it's not like the perfect, you know, I just want you to see what it looks like. My, my book will be called um, Legal Writing Simplified. And um, as you scroll through, if you see um, for now, it's not fully published yet, even though it can be any minute. Uh, Kirk and I need to have a conversation about how to do that. It's pretty much ready to go. I just, he and I will talk about it, but there's all, um, if I scroll, like you could just see parts of, you know, like the reading a case, briefing a case, um, just little, this is, you know, just the introduction before you really even get into all of it, sources of law and types of authority and um, primary sources. And you can just see how, how it's laid out. It's laid out so nicely. It's easy to read. It's easy to see. Um, and it's just all there. It's digital. And it just seems to be, for me, it's just, it's, I'm excited about it. I'm excited for students to finally use it and get the feedback. And the night, another one more nice thing is that if you get feedback that it wasn't perfect, you can go in and edit at any time and you can change it and you can add, add examples or that example didn't work well, I'll remove it. And it's, it's that easy. It's not like you have to wait for a publisher for the next edition. It's just, you can change it as quickly as you'd like. So with that, I just want to thank everyone for being here again and for listening. And again, like Kirk said, any questions you have, we're all happy to answer at the end. So I'll pass that off. Um, I guess back to Kirk to introduce the next speaker. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yes, next we have Jenny Koenig uh, from Occupational Therapy Program, who's we yeah, worked on a project for the new um, doctoral program in occupational therapy. So Jenny is at the School of Health Sciences. So uh, take it away, Jenny. Oh, Ginny, you're on mute still. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is uh, Virginia Koenig. I'm part I'm associate professor at Torrey University Manhattan campus, occupational therapy department, and I'm also the OT academic fieldwork coordinator. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the OER I developed, which turned out to be a book. I called it a guidebook, um, and it's called Optimizing Your Capstone Experience, a guidebook for ha allied health professionals. So I'm gonna share a little bit of my experience with you, give you some information and hope that you sparks you some interest to get involved in this great um, project and cause as we move forward. Okay, so let me move forward, here we go. Okay, so when I first answered the call to be part of the ORE um, projects um, and the fellows last year, I really had no idea what I was going to be doing, except that I knew that somehow it was going to be related to Torah University's new post-professional OTD program, which, as we know, with um, OT doctoral programs and PhDs, is typically a final product with deliverables, which is your culmination of an assessment at the end. Specifically for our OTD program that was brand, brand new, it still kind of is, we're still in the first year going into the second year of it, I began to um, look at the post-professional, um, the program syllabi with attention focused on the research-based courses, the program and project development courses part of the OTD program, and the capstone one and two courses in mind. So by looking at this syllabi and uh, what we were developing for this OTD program, I started to think about ideas of what I can do to contribute to this new program using an OER um, product. So what also helped as I was doing this was I was the co-instructor of the new program development course within the OTD program. And that provided me with some, not much, but some insight into our first cohort, our first group of students in the program and their needs. 
with that, with this, and looking at the syllabi, experiencing the course I was in, I knew that something would need to really be done to support students with the OTD um, program and their capstone project. But I really didn't know exactly what this would be. But I had an idea. And that's the first thing you need to start with. Where do you begin? And that's with an idea. Now, I've got my idea. Where do I go from here? So I needed to identify a need. And for you who are considering doing an OER, you want to identify a need within your program or course that is not really being addressed. Um, and that perhaps you can address, or it's not being addressed effectively, as Michelle had said, that you know, for, for the needs for your students, your group, and what you're doing. So for me, and I want to thank also, I reviewed the OT program curriculum with the OT program chair, Dr. Wong, and the OTD interim director, Dr. Orant Licker. And I want to thank them both for supporting me through this. And I began to jot down some ideas for my resource, my OER resource. As I progressed with teaching the program development course and spoke with other OTD course instructors at our, our weekly or, um, meetings, there seemed to be this recurring theme that kept popping up. And it was, to me, the anxiety that's associated with developing and implementing a capstone project. And you know, when I started to reflect on my past experience as an OTD student in a post-professional OTD program, I could understand that emotion and what they were feeling. So I started to think about developing and look for capstone project resources already in existence for OT programs and even other allied health professional students and programs that would support them through the capstone project. And there was nothing, zero, not on nothing, absolutely nothing. So I decided that I was going to develop an OER that would help guide students through the capstone process, provide them with support throughout the capstone experience, and help these students understand, grasp the understanding that the capstone process in and of itself is a journey. And though the scaffold of this capstone process is relatively stable, what is built upon that frame by each student is what makes their experience unique and special, including the anxiety that was associated with it, which can be good um, and keep you motivated. And I felt it was really important to help students, support students through the process. Um, and our population and the nature of our program, it was a post-professional OTD program. So what does that mean? We had many professionals, occupational therapists, amazing professionals, join our OTT post-professional program that have been out in the clinic for years. And now they're making this transition back into academia and having to do research to support their community-based capstone projects. And, and um, they have to do this comprehensive capstone project that runs through the entire program from the beginning until the end with this culminating project that they share with deliverables. So I thought, this is what I need to do. And as I thought about it a little more, I said, okay, I'm going to focus on OT with this, but you know what? This can expand beyond the OT program and to other allied health professional programs within Toro and beyond Toro and help them and support them through the capstone process. Um, so that was the need that I identified after I got my idea. So, what is the next thing to do? You want to then. Um, be able to identify topics that'll address that need. So you wanna outline what you wanna do for your OER research, okay? And again, remember, like any program developed, this, an OER project is also a program you're developing. It's just a deliverable project and it's dynamic in nature. So you need to understand that when you start, there's gonna be changes throughout that road and different curves and turns, but you'll have your subject, and you'll start a short summary of what you want to do in a very systematic manner. And then you'll develop an outline. Again, it's dynamic and be ready to add or delete as you begin writing and your resource becomes more focused because that's what's going to happen when you start to get down to it. 
So let me give you some tips about writing, because I know you're all really considering doing OER after this. So when considering writing, try not to think about the time. Oh my gosh, how much time this is gonna take me. But think about the focus factor, okay? Doing an OER resource takes focus, but it may not necessarily take as much time as you think it will. Let me give you some evidence to support that statement. A Clockwork Orange that was written by Anthony Burgess was written in three weeks. As I Lay Dying, that was written by William Faulkner, was written in about six weeks while he worked the night shift at a power plant. How do you like that? Okay. A Study in Scarlet was the first novel to feature legendary fictional detective Sherlock Holmes, and it took Sir Arthur Conan Doyle just three weeks to write. Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol within six weeks. And The Boy in the Striped Pajamas was written by John Boyle in two and a half days. So what's the common theme? Focus. Time, maybe not, maybe so, but focus, okay? And no, you got to have some humility. In the midst of writing, and I could vouch for this, and I'm sure the other panelists can as well, there'll be times that you believe that what you're doing is the worst thing you've ever done. Why are you doing it? Why are you spending this time doing it? And you got to question yourself. And I really do believe all writers feel that way at one time. Okay. So my recommendation when you get to that is to be, stay humble and keep moving forward. And lastly, as we talked about earlier, for the perfectionist among all of us, um, Michelle had brought up and certainly know that know me, I am as hard on myself as I am on anyone else. Understand that you may have a picture of what your book is going to look like, but that may not, not turn out to be exactly your product at the end, what you pictured originally. So be humble and that's okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Now let's talk, we already did. Why consider writing and why consider an OER? Let's look at it this way. Let's just touch on some of this. You have an idea, you identify an idea that we've talked about earlier and you see a need within your program or course that has lodged deeply in your brain that hasn't been addressed, well, now's your time to do that. How many of you have read a book so good that you wanna share that book and tell people about it with friends, family, and others? That's what can happen with your OER, the same thing. And whether you make your name, want make your name for yourself as a great writer or an expert within your field, writing an OER can be a great way to start that, okay? Writing a, an OER can be a way to leave a legacy for future generations. And if you love to write, then you might as well give OER a try. What have you got to lose, right? It's a really good sense of accomplishment. We've talked about this and, you know, and I want to talk about some of the benefits of OER very, very quickly. But I also want to say in speaking with Toro University's library professionals, they seem to get a lot of questions from people considering OER. Why should I be willing to give up all my hard work, my publications for free? So on one hand, let's think about that. If you're writing your text and you're handing it over to a publisher, that will result in the loss of your copyright. I don't know if you're aware, and each time faculty wants to use their own article or book for a course, the library actually has to pay to get that copyright clearance, okay? This will be eliminated if we do that. So an instructor will have to get copyright clearance, usually as, at a fee, so they can share their own work with their own students. Furthermore, the talk out there is that authors have expressed that the royalties from textbooks is mostly not that impressive, and it's still a lot of hard work. On the other hand, OER resources save costs for students. OER resources can lead to a shift in the role of the instructor. This is done by taking the focus on producing content and allowing instructors to focus on more instruction and helping their students learn by using a product that they've developed and they're familiar with. OER resources can actually increase the recognition of your scholarly work by making it much more widely available without signing away intellectual property rights. And subsequently, making one's work open can enhance one's academic reputation. Lastly, 
producing an OER book, from my experience, allows you to meet a great and network with a great number of professionals, as we call it in, in the health professions, interdisciplinary team within Toro University from all over the country, which is was a really amazing experience. Here, you can see the book, and you're more than welcome to visit it on Pressbooks is where um, I did my um, CC, Creative Commons licensing, and it's there for all of you to access and to use as you deem necessary for any courses, pieces of it for a course, whatever would work. Um, please feel free to use it to also let you see inside of it. Also, how did I get this, the structure? How do you structure a book? What do you do? Well, this is what I did. I don't know about all of you. I do have a little library in my home with all my little favorite books, textbooks, reading books, what it, novels, nonfiction, whatever it may be. But my textbooks, I have my favorite textbooks I've been pulling out for years and years. And those textbooks have a certain format that I found for me very conducive to learning for my learning type. So I took different pieces of those of my favorite textbooks and used it for me to bring about the structure of my book. So that's helped me to develop how I wanted to structure my book. And the last thing, here are the direct links to my book that you can see it's easy. I post that in the classes for students and I could tell them what chapter or what pages to read. And there's different ways that you can do it. And um, that's really it. And I wanna thank all of you for listening and for being part of this. And I really hope that you consider um, developing a resource. I mean, if you're developing a class or revamping a class or something, this is a great way to, to go forward. And it's very contemporary. Thank you. Thank you, Ginny. It was fantastic. Um, so, so, um, so our third fellow, uh, Michelle Bunker Alberts in California is actually actually not able to present right now, um, having te technical problems where she can't present. And um, so, uh, and also, also we're, we're at time. So I, I understand um, some people have to run to our next thing, but, um, but if we could just um, do a quick, uh, for those of us who don't have to jump off and get to their next meeting or class, um, I'd like to just open it up for a quick Q&A uh, uh, next. And um, yeah, it looks like, um, it looks like we had, uh, we got a couple things uh, put into the Q&A, which I can, which I'll just address first. And then um, anyone in the, uh, anyone can uh, add, add to that or jump in, but, um, um so the the first thing was a question um the first thing was a was a question about uh peer review uh it says can you share more information about, about the peer review process for the work created during the fellowship um that is a great question and um we do peer review for the oer things we create um on kind of a case by case basis, and some, uh, some depending on the needs of the author, instructor, and what the resource is. So, so um, yeah. So if you want it peer reviewed, it can uh, it can be done, and we do a blind um, blind peer review process where uh, reviewers you know reviewers don't know the identity of the author and um, and yeah, we have done that for uh, some of our projects. Um, and yeah, we we fa facilitate that uh, through the library. So I hope that answers that question. And um, Michelle in California. Hi, so sorry, y'all. Uh, there's something wrong with my screen, so I'm not gonna present a slide, but I, I just wanted to reiterate um, in case folks were thinking about doing the fellowship, I agree with what, um, both of my fellow uh, 
uh, fellowship, fellow fellowship folks <laughs> um, mm -hmm. presented. But I also um, wanted to, and my presentation was really um, kind of about the concept of like bringing research to practice because it, in nursing, I mean, obviously we all do this, but I think in nursing in particular, our newest degree is really focused on um, shortening the time that we spend bringing research to practice, right? And so, you know, I think the best estimate from what we've heard recently um, is it's, you know, around 17 years that it takes to bring, you know, the most updated research to practice. And so the benefits of OER are really some of the things that both um, Virginia and Michelle were talking about in terms of taking our years of experience and, and our teaching experience and bringing them into um, view, you know, in ways that we want. And, um, and I uh, just look forward to being able to answer more questions and being a resource um, if folks have questions about how we um, used our work. My work isn't quite finished, um, but as it is, I look forward to sharing it. So thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and as, um, yeah, in, in the future, all of, all of the fellows projects, the resources that they make will be, will be shared with the tour community and, and the world. So, um, so stay, stay tuned for those. Um, it, uh, looks like there's, uh, a question for Michelle Z, and but um, before I will address a quick one that came in before that, before uh, Michelle answers, um, there's another question saying, uh, do students pay a fee to access the OER from the university? Absolutely not. There are no fees involved with OER. Uh, the university doesn't, it's not like um, typical library resources where the you know the the library purchases all these resources and then loans them to students and instructors for free uh there's nothing like that it's oer is just free for anyone for for me for you for joe public and jane doe and and anyone it's free there's no fees involved um uh yeah at at any time okay so uh, Michelle, question. There is a question for you. Yeah, I see it. No, it's a great question. Um, Teresa's asking about um, she has a legal writing class at her school, but it's not part of a law school. It's not a law program. But it's a very interesting question because she's wondering whether something like an OER book like I've created for legal writing could be useful. Um, and they also have something about a criminal justice program. I don't know anything about the criminal justice program because I, I, but I, if there are OER resources out there, I would think they would be useful as well. But the reason why something like what I've written would be useful is ordinarily, I might say, don't have your students invest in a legal writing book that's for law students because it might be too advanced. It might be more than you're willing to cover in that class because it's a very intensive class for law students. But but when it's an OER book, there could be portions of it that you can get to without having them have to put out the expense of a full book. And you can use just pieces of, let's say you wanted them to try to write a very small part of a legal memorandum. You can go to the legal memorandum section, look at all the different parts, and maybe select a small portion that, you know, with, with a selected legal issue that you can discuss and spend a long time talking about, but they would have a resource there to work with and so would the teacher. So I think it's a great, I think actually it would be perfect for something like that. And if something in the criminal justice field exists use with OER, which I bet it does, we just would have to do a search for it. For the same reasons, I would think it would be an excellent resource for the students and, and for the teacher with, with zero fee. And I see somebody asked, is there a fee? It was the same person. Teresa asked about, is there a fee for, for the external school? No, there's no fee for anyone. There's no fee. That's the beauty. No fee, no permission, no, let me just write and get, you know, get some, get some answers, get access. It's just, it's there. It's like, it's like Googling something. You don't need to pay a fee to Google and get that information. It's very similar to that. Think of it in that way. Yeah, if it has exactly if it has if it has a CC license on it, a Creative Commons license, which would be just norm typically like where you would typically see a copyright statement on any kind of resource. If you see a CC license there, um, no fees for anyone, no permissions needed or anything. It's just just there, free to use. Yep. Um, 
Yeah, um, and uh, thanks, Michelle. That was that was a great answer, and that's a the the cool thing. Another cool thing about OER, the kind of modular nature that if it's that you could take a resource that's maybe written for a graduate course and use use maybe maybe two thirds of that resource for an undergraduate course. Maybe take out a few chapters that that don't fit with your curriculum. So that's um. That's also just part of the beauty of, of OER, one great way you can use it. And, and there's a question there about um, index so that the Torah community can easily find them. I know it is very easy to find, but Kirk, you might want to explain that. Ah, okay, I didn't see these additional ones, thanks. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. There's, so OER resources, they do, they're indexed in a lot of different places is the answer. There's not like one database that has every OER ever made. There's a bunch of different ones, but for Turo folks, there is one place to look um, uh, for OER stuff, which is we, we've we put together this uh, Open Turo Lib Guide, or which stands for Library Guide, if you're not familiar with those. Librarians love to make these, these things. They're just kind of like a little web page with a bunch of resources. So we have the Open Turo Lib Guide. Um, and there's a find OER tab on that libguide that lists about 10 different um, uh, OER repositories, places to search for OER. And there's even some, there's even one on there that you can search in this one database and it will search across many other databases for you and bring all the results back to one place. So um, yeah, so they're indexed in, in several places, but we have that, all those places for you on the Open Turo Library Guide. Um, and if you also, also I'm available and happy to help anyone in this searching process. If, you, um, if you're if you not sure where to look or if you tried one or two databases and didn't have luck, I'm, I'm happy to kind of advise on that process. Um, but yeah, so so we we collected a bunch of databases on that on that LibGuide, but in in keeping with Everything else we've said, you know, these are are just public, publicly open, available um, databases, not like ProQuest or or something. They're subscription. You know, this is all just out there on the internet. So, so you can also, so you can use all these databases that have powerful search tools. But that being said, since it's all just out there on the public web, you can just Google this too. You can just Google um, open educational resources and then your particular like subject matter or whatever, and you will find some things that way as well. <clears throat> um, let's see, did we have... Any any other questions? I think I've seen everything um, that we have in the Q and A. Um, I believe so. Should, I'll give just a moment if anyone else wants to um, type a question, or if anyone any other panelist has any other thing they want to say. We'll give a moment before we wrap up here, um, and I'll just say thanks to the everyone who's um, hung on with us and appreciate your time. And sorry we're going a little bit late today, but we have a lot to talk about with OER. It's exciting. <laughs> I'll just say thank you to Toro for th this opportunity to be part of this fellowship program and for meeting the other fellows and it's just been great working with everyone and working with you Kirk and 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 Sarah and everyone so thank you uh thanks Michelle I, yeah I did owe that um <laughs> anybody who is thinking about uh applying um this team is incredibly helpful it's not only really nice to meet monthly and give updates and learn about just oer because if you're like me you didn't really even know that much about oer you just thought cool a way to save my students money um i like that um but but the other piece of that is just that um what you end up with at the end is just um tons of information that you can continue to look for, look through, update, change, 
Um, and it's, it's amazing. And so the fact that this team is here kind of at your fingertips during this to provide coaching from the beginning to the end, um, even though I haven't quite gotten to the end, I'm incredibly thankful. Thank you all as Thanks, well. Sasha. And, and what a great way if you're considering to leave a legacy. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, uh, sir, there's one more, uh, one more question came into the Q and A, and then I think we can wrap it up. Um, oh, um, and someone asking for a link, uh, link for the fellowship. I can, I can send the link to apply. Um, so there's another, a question, uh, let's see right now for funding for OER for faculty. Is there any major criteria that the faculty requesting funding need to have? So the only um, the only criteria that's that's a great question, and sorry that I, I failed to mention that with the fellowship. The, the fellowship is open to any uh, full time Turo faculty. So just that they be uh, yeah full time faculty with uh, teaching you know expected anticipated teaching responsibilities in the you know the next year and for any any Turo school or program anywhere in the in the world any you know any any Turo branch uh any anywhere so faculty from all over are are um are eligible to apply And um, yeah, so we will the uh, I can share these uh, these slides that also have the links to the application and everything after this. And also the next faculty focus newsletter that goes out will have all the info for applying to the next fellowship. So look for it, look for it there as well. And um, and uh, yeah, if we don't don't have any other questions coming in, I think we can wrap up for today. So thanks thanks again for everyone sticking with us with our going going a bit over time here today. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining and uh, listening and uh, pass on pass on the news and the word about the fellowship to to all your colleagues around Turo. And I hope to hope to hear hear from anyone and everyone about it. So uh, thanks, thanks everyone for coming and have a great day.